Okay, so this is Physics 1A for April 21st. Uh, today we're going to continue to talk about momentum. Uh, the, the first topic we're going to discuss is what's called coefficient of restitution. And then we're going to do um, another kind of problem uh, that's kind of similar to what we did yesterday, but with just some more unknowns. Okay, so first topic is what's called coefficient of restitution. Okay, so just consider the following uh, setup. Um, so let's say I've got, um, let's say you're, you're bouncing some objects off of the ground, okay? So I have a flat surface right here, and let's just say it's like concrete. So you're bouncing balls uh, off of concrete. And let's say you take a few different types of things. So let's say you take like a basketball, and let's say you drop the basketball. Um, how to draw a basketball? It's got these kind of lines on it, right? So let's say you have a basketball. Let's say you have um, like um, uh, like a super bouncy ball. We'll just call it a bouncy ball. Oops. And then for a real extreme, let's say you have like a lump of clay. Or you know what's even easier? Let's say you have a bean bag. Okay. So you drop all of these objects from the same height above the ground, right? And each one of them is going to do something kind of different whenever it bounces off the ground. So the basketball, when you drop it, it's going to bounce. And you know maybe it's going to come up to about maybe 2 thirds of the height whenever it, whenever it bounces back up. So you, you bounce the ball down, and it bounces right back up to about 2 thirds of the height when you bounce it. The bouncy ball, when you bounce it, is going to go much higher. The, there's types of bouncy balls that can, can almost bounce to the original position. So you drop this one and it falls down, and let's say this one bounces back up to something like, maybe like 0 0.9 times the height. Whoops, 0 0.9 times the height. So about 90% of the height, right? And now the bean bag, you all know what this is gonna do. What happens if I drop a bean bag on the ground? Is it gonna bounce very high? It's not, right? It's just gonna kind of splat on the ground, right? Yeah, it's just gonna fall, it's gonna hit the ground. If it bounces up at all, it's going to bounce up by some like a millimeter or something, right? It's just going to fall. It's going to go splat on the ground, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So what's the point of this? The point is that, as you know, different objects are going to bounce to different heights, right? We could drop a marble. We could drop uh, a tennis ball, a baseball. They would all drop to different heights, right? A baseball maybe wouldn't bounce very much, but it would bounce, right? Um, maybe a marble would also bounce pretty high. But the point is that each of these objects is going to bounce back to a different height. And the, the way that we measure how high these things actually bounce back up is through something called coefficient of restitution. So this is going to be a measurement of kind of how springy or how technically how elastic a surface can be. Okay, so, so we'll, use, uh, we'll use this idea of bouncing objects off the ground as a way to talk about coefficient of restitution. So let's say I have a surface again right here. So here's our ground. And, and now we'll just be kind of more explicit about this. We take some ball. Okay. And we, we start off at some height above the ground. And let's use, uh, let's use Y, I guess. Let me use H, I guess. So we start off and we drop it from some height that we call H naught, okay? And we release it from rest. It falls down and it bounces off of the ground. And then it comes back up. And let's say it, it, it eventually, when it gets to its maximum height again, its rebound height is H final, okay? So we'll call this the kind of the rebound height. Now, in order to kind of analyze what's happening here, we can start off and say that this object starts from rest, and it goes and it hits the ground. And right before it hits the ground, okay, it's going to be moving downwards with some velocity, okay? And we're going to call this velocity v1, okay? And this is going to be the velocity right before it hits the ground.
That's what V1 is, okay? Right after it hits the ground, it's going to have a rebound speed. And you all tell me, I'll call this V2. Is V2 going to be less than or equal to or greater than V1? This is the velocity right after it hits the ground. Okay, a bunch of different answers, which is great. Okay, some people say less than, some people say greater, some people say equal. Okay, let me repeat what's happening. So we drop the ball from rest right before it hits the ground. It's going to pick up some speed, call that V1. It's going to bounce off of the ground, and it's going to launch back up. Now, it's not going to go as high, right, as it did before, which I would argue means that this velocity V2 should be less than this velocity V1 given that it starts from a height that we call h naught, and it only bounces to a height that we call h final. If these velocities were equal to each other, we would say that the, the bounce off of the ground would be elastic. And if the velocities were equal, it would bounce up to exactly the same height, right? It would also be working against gravity now, wouldn't it? Well, I mean, gravity is definitely helping it fall down, and it's working against it when it goes up. But if the velocities were the same, it would just bounce back up to the same height, right? We can prove that if we want to. So let's do that real quick. So if we release it from a height h naught and it gets a velocity v1, then I'm going to prove that the velocity is basically just going to be the square root of 2g h naught. And the way I'm going to do that is just by using energy conservation. So on the way down, down, we can say that uh, there's no non-conservative forces acting. We can just say change in kinetic energy plus change in potential energy should be equal to zero. And for the change in kinetic energy, it's going to be one half mass times that final velocity that I'm calling V1 minus its initial velocity, which is zero, plus change in potential energy is just mg times, well, y final is zero minus y initial is called h naught, right? Uh, canceling out the m's and solving for the velocity V1, you can rearrange this and see that you're going to get 2g times h naught. That's what the velocity is right before it hits the ground right there. Actually, since this is on the way down, I used green for the velocity vector. Let's just make that all green. And then on the way back up, right, you can get a similar relationship. Um, the velocity that it has on the ground on the way up, it's going to have a velocity that's equal to zero when it gets to the top. So I would argue that the velocity v2 is going to be related to the height h final as 2 times g times h final. And so since h final is less than h1, that means that v2 is less than v1, right? And this is happening just because of the way I set it up, because this is an inelastic collision with the ground. Some of its kinetic energy is lost when it hits the ground. That makes this collision inelastic. Right? Does that make sense to you all? You don't have any questions? So what we'd like to do is we'd like to answer the question, which is, how inelastic is it? How inelastic is the collision? Okay, and that's what coefficient of restitution is going to do for us. So the way that we're going to do that is we're going to say that the ratio of the square root of these heights is going to be related to the coefficient of restitution. But before we even do that, I want to take you back to an equation that we, uh, that we, that we learned last time. So... The equation we learned last time was that if I have two objects and they collide elastically, that there was an equation that we derived that was like, if I know what the velocity of one object is, and I subtract from that the velocity of the other object before the collision, that after the collision, the objects will have um, velocities um, v1 prime and v2 prime like this. 
So we derived this last time for, let's make sure we got the equation right. Um, oops. Let's see. So I think it was on the previous page. Yeah, this equation right here. We talked about elastic collisions. And just to remind you what we were discussing, we said, suppose that I have a mass m1 and a mass m2, and they collide elastically head on like this. Initial velocities are v1 and v2, v1 prime and v2 prime. We got this relationship between their velocities, right? Before and after the collision. Now, that was only for elastic collisions, right? So what we can do is if I have an inelastic collision, then let's go back to full screen here. So this, this relationship was for elastic collisions only. And what we can do is we can get a similar relationship for inelastic collisions if we just put like a coefficient in front of these, okay? And the way I'm going to write it is like this. We're going to write E times V1 minus V2 is going to be equal to, and we can now put this negative sign over here if we want to, V1 prime minus V2 prime. And the symbol E is what we call coefficient of restitution. And again, it's a measurement of how inelastic the collision can be. Uh, e is always going to be between 0 and 1. And if E equal to 1, that represents an elastic collision. Because you can see that it reproduces the same equation from the left. Now, what we'd like to figure out is how is this coefficient of restitution related to these heights right here, okay? Now, I was a little bit sloppy in terms of the way that I defined these variables, so I'm going to go back and change some things to clarify here. Instead of calling um, this variable of the velocity after it hits the ground v2, we're just going to call that one v1 prime, so we have the same type of notation that we used yesterday, like this, okay? So we're going to change the velocity after it hits the ground to just be called v1 prime, and I'll fix all the places where I wrote where I wrote that. Okay. And now we'd like to see how do these heights relate to the coefficient of restitution. Okay. So we have a collision that occurs here. And there's two objects that occur in the collision. We have a ball, it's dropped, it hits the ground, and then it bounces back. What are the two objects in my collision here? One of them is the ball. What's the other object? It's the ball on the ground, right? Exactly. So for, for us, when we want to evaluate this equation right here, v1 and v1 prime are going to represent the velocity of the ball before and after the collision. And v2 and v2 prime will represent the velocity of the Earth before and after the collision, OK? So let's see what that gives us. So basically, 2 is going to represent the Earth. What should we use for the velocity of the Earth before the collision with the ball? What should we use for the velocity of the Earth, which is the ground, before and after the collision with the ball? It's not going to be gravity. Gravity is an acceleration. We need to speed. Zero. That's right, Miguel. Zero. The Earth isn't moving, right, relative to the ball. The Earth is basically just sitting still. And when the ball bounces off the Earth, you know, the Earth isn't going to move very much, right? It's, it's way too big. Its velocity is basically going to be zero. Okay. So now let's take those two right there. And let's plug them into our equation right here. So our equation now is going to say negative e, the coefficient of restitution, multiplied by v1 minus 0 is equal to v1 prime minus 0. So this means that negative e times v1 is equal to oops, v1 prime. Now, what are v1 and v1 prime is in terms of these things? Well, we said before that v1 was equal to the square root of 2 times g times h0, right? That's what we derived right here. And I said that v1 prime was equal to square root of 2g times h final, and its, its speed is certainly equal to that. But one of these needs to be negative, basically, right? 
So let's just define up as positive. We'll define the up direction to be positive y or something like that. And then v1 needs to be a negative number now, right? Keep in mind that when you solve these things, you actually get a plus or a minus. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that v1 prime is going to be positive, And we'll make v1 to be a negative. Okay. Because, yeah, v1 is down, right? And v1 prime is up. So for v1, we're going to write we're going to write this as negative, and then for v1 prime, we'll write it as positive up there. So let's plug our numbers into this equation now. So what we have is negative e. Whoops, I don't know, I didn't need to get yellow. So we've got negative e times v1, which is negative square root of two times g times h naught, is equal to v1 prime, which is this one positive square root of 2 times g times h final. Negative negatives cancel. The square roots are all going to cancel. And we actually get a relationship for what e is equal to. We get that e is equal to the square root of, so cancel a bunch of stuff out, h final divided by h initial. So for example, if h naught was equal to, uh, let's say, 1 meter, we drop the ball from 1 meter, and if h final was, let's say, 0 0.75, so it bounces up to about 3 quarters of the height, then what would e be equal to? Well, e would just be equal to the square root of 1 divided by 0 0.75. And whatever that is. Square root of 4 thirds. So it's going to be the... 2 over the square root of 3, which will be like a little bit more than 1. Or sorry, a little bit less than 1. Square root of 1 divided by... Oh, I, I flipped them upside down. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm bad. Square root of 3 quarters. That's what it should be. H finals in the numerator, right? So this is going to be 0.75 meters divided by H naught, which is 1 meter. There we go. So if we do the square root of 0.75... We're going to get 0.866. So e in this case would be equal to 0 0.866. It's it doesn't have units basically, right? And so this is a measurement of how elastic or how inelastic that occlusion is. Anyone have any questions? What would e be equal to if you drop the ball from some height and it bounced back up to the same height? be one, right? And that would represent an elastic collision, right? That would mean no energy was lost, right? No energy was lost at all. If I drop the ball and it doesn't bounce up to the same height, there must be some energy lost, right? Because I've got some potential energy right here. I have less potential energy right here after the collision. So energy was lost. So that has to be an inelastic collision, inelastic. But if the ball bounces all the way back up to the top, What do you think the uh, coefficient of restitution would be for the beanbag? Remember that you basically just do square root of h final divided by h initial. Is it ever possible to be above the starting position page? I don't know. I do know that there are certain types of... So you, I'm sure you've all, when you were kids, or I don't know, you played with like the super balls, the bouncy balls. That's right, Kelvin. For a beanbag, the coefficient of restitution would be zero. Exactly. Um... So there's these super balls that you can buy. And I think some of them are made from some type of a material that um, can make them bounce really close to the same height. I don't know if anything can bounce higher than the same height. You'd have to have something happen when the ball hits the ground where there was some type of internal chemical energy that gets converted into kinetic energy. Um, and I'm pretty sure that some of the like super balls are made like this, so that um, when when the ball hits the ground, like maybe it heats up a little bit, and somehow converts that heat into some extra kinetic energy. I don't really know. Um, some billiard balls are supposedly made like this too. That when the billiard balls collide, that there's some type of extra energy. But in a way, it would. Page to answer your question. In order for the ball to go higher than the starting position you'd kind of almost have to violate conservation of energy, or you'd have to be getting energy somehow from the from what's going on. So there, there, there are some ways I could think about doing this. Like, for example, 
Suppose that instead of dropping a ball, what I drop is an object, and this object has a spring on the bottom, okay? But you start off with the spring compressed, so the spring is already compressed by some amount, right? And then it's made somehow that whenever it hits the ground, the spring, like, uncatches or something like that. Like, maybe the spring is held in place or something, and then when it hits the ground, maybe these supports break or something like that. Then the object could hit the ground and bounce higher, but only because there was some type of internal energy stored in some kind of a spring or something like that. Does that answer your question? You'd have to have either some chemical process that would make it bounce higher, like a explosion that could occur, or, um, or or like a spring. So you'd have to have something else that would store that energy up to be used later on. Um, but again, I, I do think that some of these super balls are made, if you go buy one, that they will bounce to really, really, really close to the same height, for sure. Now, there is something you can do. This is something you can try at home if you want to. As long as you have you have to have two balls, they need to have different sizes, okay? Um, different masses really is the key. So the, the classic example is this: you take a you take a basketball, okay? So here's my basketball, and on top of the basketball you place a tennis ball. So here's a tennis ball. So you have tennis ball, basketball, right? You hold both of them. You try to keep the tennis ball right on top of the center of the basketball like this, right? And you basically just, you drop them from rest like this right here. Has anyone ever done this before? You've done this before? Where you take a basketball and a tennis ball? You have? Okay, cool. And so what happens? Yeah, the tennis ball goes flying extremely high. Much higher than the initial height, right? So if you drop it from some height h, the tennis ball ends up bouncing like three times as far up, right? Yeah, it's crazy, right? So, um, you know, it, now that you know something about um, momentum and collisions, you can actually calculate how high the tennis ball should go if you want to. And it's going to turn out it's related to the ratio of the masses. Um, but, uh, yeah, okay, cool. All right, so uh, we want to use this coefficient of restitution thing to solve a problem. Now, I want to I wanna emphasize something about this equation here. So this equation in general, and this shows up on, um, come on. Uh, this equation is only good in a direction perpendicular to um, the surface, basically. So sometimes the way this is written is you can put, and this is the way it's written in your textbook, you could just say we just want the component that's perpendicular to the surface. Okay, so this is the version of this equation that you're going to see in the little note packet, the, uh, this one right here. So that's what that little symbol right there means. This equation is only good in the direction perpendicular to the surface of contact. Okay. Now, we'll go through the the, equa the problems that we'll do today. That'll always be true, but I'll, I'll talk about one problem in which uh, it gets a little more tricky. Okay, here's a simple example: a golf ball is traveling at 20 meters per second and makes a head-on collision with a truck traveling at 25 meters per second in the opposite direction. So, golf ball going at 20 meters per second to the right, truck traveling at 25 meters per second to the left. If the coefficient of restitution between the two surfaces is 0 0.8, find the velocity of the ball after the collision. Problem makes sense? This problem is really fast, so I'll give you a second to think about it. Okay, so we've got two objects. Let's label um, what's going on. So let's call the golf ball one, and let's call the car, or the truck, truck two. So we're gonna say that the velocity of the golf ball before the collision is gonna be 20 meters per second. We don't know what the velocity of the golf ball after the collision is. The velocity of the truck, we'll call that number two, before the collision is going to be, we'll have to do negative 25 because it's going to the left. So I'm basically making this the positive x direction. Negative 25 meters per second for the truck. 
What do you think the velocity of the truck is going to be after the golf ball hits it? It's the same. It's not going to change, right? Yeah, because it's just a golf ball. So we just want to solve for this one. And what we know is that the coefficient of restitution is uh, 0 0.8. So plugging all that information in up here, we're trying to solve for v1 prime, right? So we're going to have, uh, let's just, let's write it out and then we'll plug the numbers in. So negative e times v1 minus v2. All of the velocities are in the direction perpendicular to this surface, right? So this would be the perpendicular direction, basically. And that means we can apply this equation. So we'll have negative e times v1 minus v2, and then we need to add v2 prime onto the side, and that should be equal to v1 prime. So we'll have negative 0 0.8 multiplied by v1, which was 20, minus v2, which is negative 25. Be careful about these double negatives here. And then plus v2 prime, which is also negative 25. And that's equal to v1 prime. So if we add all these up, we have 20 plus 25 is 45. 45 divided by 5 is 9 times 4 is 36 times a negative sign. Negative 36 plus negative 25. That's what I think you're going to get. Is that right? There we go. Now, if the coefficient of restitution is 1, we would have gotten, what, negative 45. And 45 plus 25 would be 70. So it's a little slower than it would have been if the... It would have been like negative 70 meters per second if the coefficient of restitution was 1. And again, to repeat what that means, if the coefficient of restitution is 1, that means it's an elastic collision. This is an inelastic collision, and we know just how inelastic it is. Pretty simple, right? Anyone have any questions? Right. So let's do another coefficient of restitution problem. And I'm going to grab... I'm going to grab this equation right here. Because we're going to want to use that one. Fix the. We're going to want to use this one for this equation. And we'll probably need this one too. So that was our definition of coefficient of restitution in terms of the heights, and that is our velocity relationship right there. Okay. All right, so here's the problem. A ball is dropped from a height capital H, and it rebounds to a height little h. We want to find the coefficient of restitution e and we want to find the time it takes to stop bouncing. We've already really done the first part, actually. So we're really mostly going to be doing the second part, which says to find the time that it takes to stop bouncing. All right. So ball starts from a height, capital H. It bounces, and it rebounds to a height, little h. And it's then going to keep bouncing and bouncing and bouncing and bouncing and bouncing. And we're supposed to figure out the time that it takes to stop bouncing. So, I'm going to draw another picture of this. Okay, so we start off with a ball, which I'm just going to use the little dot to represent. It starts off at a height that we call capital H. It falls down, it bounces off the ground, it bounces back up to a height that is not as high as it started is then going to fall to the ground. It's going to bounce again. It's going to bounce up to another height. It's not going to be quite as high again. Each time it's not going to fall as far, right? Bounces again, bounces up to here, 
bounces again, bounces up to here, bounces again, bounces down to here. And eventually it will stop bouncing, right? So it bounces up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down again, okay? And we have different heights for all of these. So the, this one right here, the height is little h. And what I'd like to do is, instead of using the symbol that's used right here, what I'd like to do is, I'd like to call this initial height h naught, and I'm gonna call this height h1. So I think that for what we're gonna do, this is gonna make what we're, the calculations a little simpler. So we're gonna say it starts off from an initial height that we call h naught. The second height is gonna be h1. The third height is gonna be h2, and so on and so forth. This one will be h3. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, down to H whatever, H and H 100 or whatever it takes before it stops bouncing. Okay. All right. So given this information, part A says to find the coefficient of restitution. Well, that's easy because our equation right here tells us that the if I take the final height after the bounce and I divide by the initial height before the bounce, that gives me the coefficient of restitution. So in our problem, what that is, is, well, the h, h naught is the same. The initial height was h naught. What's the final height for the first bounce? It's h1. So that goes up here. So there we go. There's our coefficient of restitution. We've already, we've already done the solution for that, basically, right? Any questions about that? OK. Time it takes to stop bouncing. How can we figure that out? Maybe we start off with a simpler question. How can I figure out the time that it takes for it to fall from its starting location down to the ground? How can I find how long it takes for the ball to drop from its starting location to the ground? Keep in mind that it's dropped from rest. Yeah, that's right. So we can use effectively like one of the kinematic equations, right? We can say delta y is going to be equal to vy initial times t plus 1 half times uh, the acceleration in the y direction times times squared. And our delta y is going to be like negative h naught. Our initial velocity in the y direction is 0. Our acceleration is going to be negative g, so negative 1 half gt squared. And that gives us exactly what you said, h equal to gt squared, 1 half gt squared, right? And that means that the time is going to be equal to 2 times h naught divided by g square root. We'll call that t naught. That's the time for the first fall, right? Anyone have any questions about that? So to indicate that on the diagram over here, that would be like here. What part do you want me to break down again? What part were you confused about, Hanif? We have, an, we have a ball. It drops from rest. So it has an initial velocity that's equal to 0. It falls through a height h naught. So this is going to be delta y. So delta y is going to be equal to negative h naught because it's falling down. I'm making positive y up, right? So that's delta y. That's its initial velocity. Its acceleration is just negative g. I don't know, it's a kinematic equation. Does that make sense, Anif? OK, good. All right. So that's the time for the first fall, right? Um, let's define t1, OK, as being the time to go from here up to here, and then back to the ground again. Okay, let's call that one t1, and let's calculate what that's equal to. Well, we know the time that it takes to fall from a height t1 to the ground would be basically just this. And I would argue that it takes half the time to go from the ground, sorry, to go from the top to the ground as it would to go from the ground to the top. So if we call t1 the time to go from here 
up to here and then back down again, I would argue that that time should be double this thing. 2 times the square root of 2 h1 divided by g. And the 2 here is because the first fall on h0, it just had to fall from the top down to the bottom. Now, to cover the height h1, it has to go from the bottom back up to the top. That's going to take 2 h1 over g square root. And then it has to fall from there back down again. So that's going to take that right there. Does that make sense to everyone? Now we can continue this process for each of the different steps, right? We can go to, what's another color I can use here? Let's use light blue or something. We can go for the height. This is all simple kinematic stuff here. If you're getting confused, then um, you're probably overthinking a little bit. So, so here for H2, let's just do the H2 one. It's at rest right here, right? It's at rest at that point, right? So we can apply all the same arguments that we did right here. Use basically the distance that it's going to fall, which is h2, should be equal to 1 half gt squared. And that means that you're going to get a time to fall of 2 times h2 divided by g square root. That's the falling time, right? And the time that it's going to take to, to, to rise up to that height should be exactly the same, right? It's symmetrical. To go from here up to here, and to go from there down to there, the time should be exactly the same, right? The time to go up is the same as the time to go down. So then T2, the time to go to rise and fall, is twice this, two times that time, which is going to be 2 square root of 2 h2 divided by g. Do you all understand? Okay. So let's, let's just kind of circle what we've done here. This is the time for the first fall, right? Now, why do I care about the time? Well, we're trying to find the time it takes to stop bouncing, right? That's the time it takes for the first fall. This is the time it takes to go up and down again for the second bounce. And then this is the time that it takes to go up and down again for the third bounce, right? So what I would say is that the total time to stop bouncing is going to be something like T0 plus T1 plus T2 plus T3 plus dot, 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 where each of these are going to represent subsequent bounces. And if we start to plug in what we have, so we had that t naught was equal to the square root of 2 h naught divided by g. We had that t1 was double square root of 2 h1 divided by g. T2 is 2 times the square root of 2 times h2 divided by g. And we did write it down, but T3 would be 2 times the square root of 2 times h3 divided by g. Plus dot, 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 until h is 0, basically, right? Or until the time is 0. Does this equation make sense to everyone? Okay. The next thing we want to do is we want to factor some stuff out. Now, remember that this is E, right? So if I can get that to show up anywhere in my equation, that's really good. And I'm going to be able to get that to happen if I factor out this entire first term right here. So let's factor out the square root of 2 h naught over g from our entire expression. So the first term would just be 1, right? The second term is going to be 2 
multiplied by the square root of h1 divided by h0. Because if I divide this term underneath this term right here, the square root of 2's cancel, the square root of g's cancel, and I just have h1 divided by h0. If I do the same thing for this term right here, I'll get the square root. See, the square root of 2 over g is in every term, so I don't need to keep writing that. But then I'll have h0 in the denominator. So here I'll have h2 divided by h0. plus 2 square root h3 divided by h0 plus dot dot dot. That's equal to the total time. All right. Now, can I make any replacements? Can anyone see a replacement? OK, did everyone understand that algebra first of all? You can multiply this back in here, and you'll get the exact same thing that we had before, I think, unless you see that I made a mistake, and if so, let me know. OK, do we see anywhere where we can put coefficient of restitution in? Does this, does this term appear anywhere? It does, right? It's, it's right there, right? Square root of h1 over h0, right there. That's, that's e, right? So uh, let, me, let me move this down just a little bit so we can do some math with it, and I can keep going. All right. Now, just to remind you, the whole point of what we're doing here is to find the time it takes to stop bouncing. And we've got into just pure math right now, but that's okay. So what do we have? We have square root of 2 times h0 divided by g multiplied by 1 plus 2 times e. Okay. So then what is this going to be? Well, if we rearrange this equation right here, what we can do is we can say that this states that e squared multiplied by h0 is equal to h1, right? Or put it another way, h0 is basically equal to um, h1 divided by e squared, right? So if I plug that into the second term right here, let's do it off to the side right here. So then what that means is if I have square root of h2 divided by h0, which shows up in that term right there, that this is equal to um, the square root of h2 divided by h1, and then there's an e squared, so it's like this, which is equal to, I believe, e multiplied by the square root of h2 divided by h1. So all we did was we looked at this term, it's h2 over h0. I said from that equation, rearrange it, you get that h0 is equal to h1 over e squared. You plug that in for h0, you have h2 over h1, the e squared goes to the numerator, it's squared so we can pull it out, and you get e times the square root of h2 over h1. Hmm, but what's this equal to? This is the square root of the ratio of h2 to h1. And if you think about what h2 and h1 were, they were, I drop a ball from a height h1, it bounces off the ground, and it bounces back up to a height h2, right? So what could I replace this with? Is that your answer, Chris? So I, I didn't see if you wrote that before or after. That is your answer to this one, right? Yeah, that's the right answer. It's e. That's right, it's e. Exactly. This is also the coefficient of restitution, right? I mean, just, just look at the equation. The equation basically says you take the initial height, put it on the bottom, you take the final height, you put it on the top, and then you take the square root. And since this is the same ball on the same surface, the square root of the ratio of any of these is equal to e, right? Like, e is not only equal to the square root of h1 over h0, it's also equal to the square root of h2 over h1, yeah, it's just a different set of eight. That's right, Kelvin, exactly. It's also equal to the square root of h3 over h2. It doesn't matter which one you do. Each one of the bounces is the same in terms of this relationship. So yeah, so what that means is the square root, let's get our final answer here. The square root of h2 divided by h0 is actually just equal to e squared. So our second term here is actually plus 2e squared. 
And I think this pattern is pretty easy to figure out, right? So this was e to the 0, 1 e to the 0, 2 e, 2 e squared. What do you think the next one's going to be? 2 e cubed, right? Plus 2 e to the 4th plus dot, dot, dot. Okay. So that's our equation. I don't need to write e to the 0, but you know, it helps to see the, uh, the pattern, I guess. Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, let's see, the next thing I want to do, I believe, is to factor out. I'm going to factor a 2e out of just this part of my sum right here. Factor a 2e out of just that part. So we'll get 2e times 1 plus e plus e squared plus e cubed plus. Like that. And now we can simplify even further. We have an infinite sum. And the sum that we're doing is 1 plus e plus e squared plus e cubed. And keep in mind that we know that e is a number that is less than 1, but greater than 0. It's a fraction, right? And when you do a sum like this, for example, say e was 1 half. We'd be doing 1 plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth plus a thirty-second plus a sixty-fourth plus so on and so forth, right? And certainly you have all seen this at some point in one of your math classes. How can I, what is that type of a series called? Or that type of a sum called? Or how do you sum it? Whatever you, I mean, if you don't remember the name, that's fine. But I think you've all seen this. It's called a geometric series, right? That's right, Andrew. That's a series in which the ratio of each term is the same, right? So the ratio of the second term to the first term is e. The third term to the second one is e. The ratio of e cubed over e squared is e, right? Exactly. Geometric series. This is a geometric series. And we know how to solve it, right? Does anyone remember? If you don't remember, it's okay. But how you simplify this solution right here? What's that sum equal to? It's a, it's a fraction, right? It's okay if you forgot. People always, I mean, if it was a half, the answer would be two. Is that what you're saying, Chris? Yes. But what is it if, what if, what is it if the ratio is E? You know, what if it was a quarter or something like that? What's the general form? You don't remember? It's one over something. Do you remember what this goes in the denominator? I'm gonna give you one more second. It's one minus r. It's like this. The sum of, I don't know if you all remember that or not, but yeah. Okay, so that's what that's equal to. If I have the sum of some r, which is a ratio or a, fa a fraction, to the n power from n to infinity, it's equal to one over one minus r. And that's when I believe the first term is one. If the first term is e, it would be it'd be like r over r minus r, one minus r. Okay, so then what we get is square root of two h naught divided by g multiplied by one plus two e, and then the entire series just gets replaced with one over one minus e. Power of infinite sums. And that's our that's our answer. That this is the answer to the problem. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to actually put some numbers in here and solve so we can actually see how long it would take. The answer is not infinity um, because this is this is going to be a, a convergent series, right? Um, so let's say we pick some numbers. So let's say we let um, the initial height be equal to, let's say, 10 meters. Nice, tall. This is like dropping that off of a tall building, right? 33 feet, 33 feet tall. Um, and let's say that E is a pretty sizable number. So let's use 3 quarters for e, okay? Or we don't have to write it as a fraction. We can write 0.75. Let's use let's use 0 0.75 for e. So that means that on the first bounce, it's going to bounce pretty high. It's going to bounce like very close to the the initial height. Um so you'd think this would take a while to stop bouncing, but let's see what we get for our answer. So then the total time 
to stop bouncing would be square root of two multiplied by 10 meters, initial height that we start from, divide by g, that's 9.8. And then we need to multiply by one plus two times e, so e is 0.75, multiplied by one over one minus 0 0.75. And that should give us an answer. And we can see how long would it take to stop bouncing. Do we have any predictions how long it would take? So the first bounce would take 1.4 seconds to fall. And then we take that and we multiply by all this stuff in the parentheses. You get a really nice number. I got 10, almost exactly. 10 seconds, that's what I got too, again. Yeah. We can kind of see how that worked out. So the first, just the pieces of this, this first part here was 1.4286 seconds. That's what you get on the first part. And you're multiplying by one plus, two times three quarters would be six over four, right? Or three over two? What? Yeah, three over two. And you're multiplying by one over one minus 0.75. One minus 0.75 would be 0.25, which is a quarter, and you're doing this, taking the inverse of it, right? So what is three? So 12 over two is, it's like seven basically, right? So it ends up being, the entire inside here ends up just being seven multiplied by that, and you get 10 seconds. I'm pretty sure this is really close to equal to 10 over 7, right? This is almost, oh no, it's really close to the square root of 2. Anyway, there we go. Anyone have any questions? Yeah, I got 99. I got, I got the same thing, Johan. I got, or Paige, I got 9.99997 or something like that. Yeah. Okay, so that's, a, I, I like this problem a lot. I don't know if you all found that interesting or not, but. I kind of like it when we get to use mathematics that are not so, you know, mostly in this class we use just algebra, trig, calculus, right? But it's nice every once in a while to use something that doesn't show up very often, like geometric series, uh, to see that there are applications for this kind of stuff. Yeah, it, it is interesting because you don't see this stuff very much past your, uh, and I will say if, you, if, you, if you're going into, you know, physics or engineering, then you'll start to see series a lot, but it won't be until much later on. But uh, yeah, it's a nice problem. It's a little, a little complicated, I think. But, uh, you know, it allows us to look at coefficient of restitution. Okay, we are almost out of, like, the normal time that we would do here, but I, I want to do one more problem because uh, we, didn't, we didn't get to this type of problem last time, and I know it shows up on your homework, and so I want to make sure that we've addressed it. So we did a glancing collision yesterday. It looked a lot like this. The collision that we did was inelastic. We never proved it, but I said you could prove it yourselves. It was an inelastic collision. This is an elastic collision. And the biggest difference between what we did last time and what we're going to do today is we're going to have one additional piece of it missing information, which is going to make it a little bit more difficult. So it says figure 8.27 shows, this is from University of Physics, this is from your textbook. It shows an elastic collision of two pucks, masses MA of 0.5 kilograms and MV of 0.3 kilograms on a frictionless air hockey table. Puck A has an initial velocity of 4 meters per second in the positive x direction, as shown right here. Puck B is at rest. Find the speed VB2 of the puck B and the angles alpha and beta. I'm going to rename these variables. I hate their variables. I don't really hate their variables. I just know that lots of subscripts can be really confusing for students. So we'll change all these, these things. But uh, that's basically our setup right there. Uh, hockey puck moving to the right collides elastically with another hockey puck that is at rest. And the first hockey puck is going to kind of be, you know, glance off this way, and the other one's going to glance off the other way. And we need to find alpha, beta, and VB2. All right. 
and it's an elastic collision that isn't head-on. All right, so let's go ahead and start renaming some of these things. All right, so we're gonna call the initial velocity just the initial. Let's come in here with back. So we're gonna say that this one is just gonna be V naught. And I'm just gonna call this final velocity here, I'm just gonna call that VA. And I'm gonna call this final velocity here, I'm just gonna call that VB. So we have VA, VB, and V initial. Those are the only things that I'm gonna change. Everything else I'll use the same variables that they use. All right. And uh, we're gonna to wanna to use momentum conservation for this. And because it's an elastic collision, we're also gonna use kinetic energy conservation. So let's get to it. So we're gonna end up having three equations to solve this problem. Um, I guess I could write up here. The first equation we're gonna use is the sum of all momenta in the x direction initially should be equal to the sum of all momenta in the x direction final. We're also gonna have sum of all momenta in the y direction initial is equal to sum of all momenta in the y direction final. And the final equation that we're going to use is the initial kinetic energies. We're gonna sum up those and those should be equal to the kinetic energies after the collision. So those are our three equations that we're going to write down. All right, what well, can I write down the left-hand side of this equation for the initial momentum of the system in the x direction? So this one is moving, but this one isn't. So it's just gonna be the mass of object A multiplied by its initial velocity, which we're calling the initial. This one doesn't have any momentum, right? For the final momentum in the x direction, we have a velocity at two meters per second here, a velocity at, we don't know here, one is at an angle alpha and one is at an angle beta. So we're gonna have to break these up into components, right? Um, this one, we'll say, can be broken up into components like this. where this side is gonna be VA times the sine of alpha, and this side will be VA cos alpha. So that'll give us an X component here that can go into the final X momentum. So we'll have MA VA times the cosine of alpha plus, we do the same thing for VB here. We can break VB into a component that goes this way and this is VB. We can also have a component that goes this way. Since that's beta, this is also beta, which means this is gonna be VB cos beta on this side and VB sine beta on this side. So for my X equation, we're gonna have M times B times this velocity. And then we want just the X component, which is gonna be coming from the cosine of beta. And that's our X equation. Does anyone have any questions about that? Now we want to do the Y equation. What's the Y, what's the y momentum before the collision? Zero, that's right, because this object is moving purely along the x-axis. There's no, there's nothing moving in the y direction. So the left-hand side is zero. And the right-hand side will be just like the this equation here. We're just going to have sines, right? So MAVA times the sine of alpha. And then I'm going to say because VA sine alpha is up and VB sine beta is down, we'll throw a minus sign in here. Somewhere here I should identify what it is we're actually solving for. So we're trying to find, because this is gonna look like just a bunch of variables. We don't know what VB is, we don't know what alpha is, and we don't know what beta is. These are all unknown. This is why this problem is a little harder than what we did yesterday. Okay, but there's our, there's our Y equation. And now we wanna do kinetic energy. 
For kinetic energy, the initial kinetic energy of the system is all contained within object A. So we'll have 1 half ma va squared is equal to. After the collision occurs, oh, it's not va before the collision, is it? It's v0. Oops. And then we're going to have 1 half after the collision, ma times its velocity, which I'm calling va, plus 1 half mv vp squared. So those are our three equations. And initially I was thinking I would save a lot of space by, by doing this, but I think what we'll do is I'm just going to move this stuff down so that they all kind of line up. Because we don't really need the picture anymore. All right, so those are our equations right there. And we got to solve. And we have a lot of unknowns. Um, so, so equation one has three unknowns, alpha, beta, and VB. Same thing for equation two. Now equation three only has one unknown, I think, right? It's just VB, right? Because we know VA. Yeah. That's great. So let's let's solve for it. Let's solve for VB. So there's an even harder version of this problem, by the way, where you don't know the velocities, but you do know an angle. That's the hardest version of these kind of problems. But we'll talk about how to solve those here in a second, in case you get one like that. All right. Things are a little bit colliding together here. I probably should use different colors for all these. All right, so VB squared, according to this equation, we can say that VB, it looks like, is equal to uh, MA times V initial squared minus VA squared, all divided by MB, and we take a square root. So yeah, VB, we just need to, so the one halves all cancel, um, you move the VA squared to the left-hand side of the equation. So you get MA V naught minus this, factor out an MA, divide by an MB, square root it, you get that. If you work out the math yourself, that's probably what you're going to get. Let me know if I made a mistake, though. Okay, MA is 0 0.5. MB is 0 0.3 multiplied by the initial was four. And the final or VA is two. Sixteen minus four. Twelve. Twelve divided by three. Four. Four times five is twenty. This is going to be the square root of 20, which is like, I don't know, 4 point something. What do you all get if you calculate this? Four point four seven. Okay. Anyone else get the same answer? You know what? I actually might want to have the exact number in my calculator, so I'm going to calculate it too, because we might want to use that. So 5 divided 3 times 16 minus 4. 4.472136, yeah, 4 right? All right. All right. Oh, yours goes, yours goes way farther than mine, Kelvin, there. I like that. Way more digits. I only have like seven. Yeah, I, I say it because we're going to find there's a really... Uh, actually, in this problem, there's not, so I guess it doesn't matter. Okay, uh, now we just need to solve for the other two things. Now now that we know VB, um, it's not enough to solve... Because we could plug in VB here, but we'd still have two unknowns. And we'd have this... So... Okay, so if we, let's see if I can say this without actually doing it. Maybe, maybe I need to do it to actually show it. If we plug VB into this equation right here, right? So we just, we stick VB in there. 
we're still going to have two unknowns, and one is going to be sign off and one's going to be sign beta, right? And it's kind of difficult to solve for alpha and then plug it into this equation, right? You know what I mean? Would you all agree with that? Because if we solve for alpha, the solution is going to be like something like the arc sine of this divided by this, right? It would get really messy. And then we've got the arc sine of something, and then we have to plug it into a cosine function. And then we're going to have the cosine of the arc sine of a bunch of stuff. And one of the things inside of that bunch of stuff is going to be beta. And then after having all that junk and then figuring out what the cosine of the arc sine is, we're still going to have a cosine beta sitting over here. So we're ultimately going to have to use some type of trig identities to probably solve this. And it's just, it'll become a mess, right? All right so there's a way to avoid all that. And this, this, this will work in pretty much all of these type of problems. So what I'm going to do is um, we're going to we'll use a different color here so we can indicate that we're doing a different step. So we'll take this piece right here and we'll just rearrange it so that it says ma va times the sine of alpha is equal to mb vb sine beta. And then I'm going to take this equation over here and I'm going to rearrange it so that all of the MA stuff is together. So on the left-hand side, we'll have MA times V naught minus VA uh, cos alpha, oops, cosine alpha. And this is equal to MB VB cos beta. And now we're going to take this equation. and kind of line these up like this. And now you start to see there's a lot of similarity between these two equations, right? Now, the first equation on the left-hand side had this V naught in it, but otherwise, the right-hand side is MBVB, MBVB, sine beta, cos beta. You've got sine alpha here and you've got cos alpha here, right? Can anyone guess what I'm gonna do next? What would you do? Remember that alpha and beta are both unknowns. But I kind of like to try to get rid of one of them here. And there's something we can do to get rid of beta. Can you think of any operations that you could do between these two equations to get rid of beta? I mean, I mean completely eliminate it from the equation, so we have just one, un one unknown. Yeah, that's right, Chris. You know that sine squared beta plus cosine squared beta is equal to one. Exactly, that's a very intelligent observation. So how could I get that to show up in my equation, Chris? What would I need to do? Square both sides, exactly. So we're going to square this equation. We're going to square this equation. And we're going to add them together. That's what we're going to do. OK, the right-hand side, which is the easier one to do, is going to become mb squared vb squared multiplied by sine squared beta plus cosine squared beta. And we know that this is equal to 1. Left-hand side is a little trickier. We are squaring everything, the whole equation. So let's just do this step by step. The first one is going to be
and then squaring this one down here, we're gonna get ma squared times v naught squared. plus ma squared times this term squared. Oh no, did we eliminate all the variables? No, we're still gonna have one left over because of the cross term, right? And then minus, when we square out this binomial right here, we're gonna get a cross term that's gonna be negative two. It's gonna be, there's an ma, and then it's V naught VA. I almost left myself enough room. So again, the cross term that's gonna show up here is gonna be two times MA from there, V naught VA, and then a cosine alpha. Okay. And now we can solve. There's only one variable left, right? Do you have any questions about what we just did? Does anyone see any algebraic errors that I made? I'll give you a chance to work it out yourself if you want to. All right, so let's go ahead and solve now. The right-hand side is just going to be mb vb squared. We can group together this term and this term. Those will become because of the sine squared plus cosine squared being equal to 1. And then we have plus ma v naught squared minus 2 ma v naught va cosine alpha. We want to solve for cosine alpha. If we do that, we're going to get cos alpha is equal to, we need to add this this way, subtract this over here. That should have been squared right there. That also should have been squared. And then we just need to divide by all this chunk. This is squared too, right? I'm so sorry. I'm gonna indicate with a different color the error that I made here. This MA was all squared. So that needs to be squared. That needs to be squared. And all of that junk is equal to cosine alpha. So if we plug in the numbers, we're gonna get alpha is equal to the arc cosine of Okay, what was MA? 0.5. I don't want to write it twice, so we'll just factor it out. VA was two, 4, I think. No. VA is 2, and V naught is 4. Okay. So this is 4 squared plus the initial is two. Nope, I guess it doesn't matter which is which does it, but. Which is the velocity after? Yeah, it's two, okay. VA is two. Let me, let me do it correctly so it's not confusing what I'm doing here. As if it's not already concluding. Okay, two meters per second squared plus the initial was four meters per second squared minus mb, which is 0 0.3 kilograms, multiplied by vb, which we just calculated to be 4.47, all 
all divided by 2 times ma squared. And then v initial was 4, va was 2. And there we go. All that is equal to alpha. Did anyone see any mistakes I made there? Super, super easy to see. Super easy for me to, to have made a mistake there. Oh, there's a, there's a missing squared sign right here. Yeah, thank you. That's squared. It's always good whenever you do this, and uh, so I got 0.8. The arc cosine of 0.8 is going to be like 30, I think. 37, I mean. Problem's pretty long. I mean, it took us almost 30 minutes to do it, actually. So I got th approximately 37 degrees. All this, I got about 36.8 degrees. We're going to call that 37 degrees for alpha. And for beta, we can go back and use this equation if we want to. It's probably the simplest one to solve for beta. I'll let you all do that yourselves if you want to. I think we've done enough of this because I mean at that point we've we've definitely done the hard part already. I think this this is the hard part. I know you have a homework problem where you have to do this at least one maybe two. But the only time you're really ever going to need to do this probably is when you have this kinetic energy show up. That's not necessarily true though because there are definitely problems when you can use this strategy sometimes. Okay, that's where I'm going to stop for today. It's an hour and a half, a little bit longer than normal for Thursdays, but um, I'll stick around if anyone has any questions. Actually, before I close the stream, does anyone have any questions? Hey, Professor, quick question. Yeah, sure, Calvin, we can do that. Um, so if you're only given the angle instead of the final velocity, then both VA and VB would be unknown. But you would know the angle. So I'm pretty sure you could do everything that we just did, except the difference would be that cosine alpha would be your um, your known. You would know this one. You would not know VA, though. So what would happen is when you got to like this line right here, you would, you would go through the same process. You wouldn't really use the kinetic energy conservation equation. You would just use these two, I believe. And then when you got to this line right here, your only unknown would be VA. Oh no, VB would be an unknown. Yeah, so you, that's the other step. So you get to this line, VA would be an unknown, but VB squared, you would use this equation, the kinetic energy equation to eliminate VB squared, and you'd be left with just just VA. You get a quadratic equation too. Did that? Did, that, did any of that make sense, Kelvin? <laughs> Basically, you just have you, you're still going to do the same process. Um, you're just going to have to like use. You're just not going to know the, the velocity basically. It's not really harder because it's still the same process. It's still the same equations, but um, it's just like one, one or two more steps, basically, I guess, in terms of the solving. Okay, thanks for everyone's questions. I